what do you do when God's doing a new thing right in front of you? You're having coffee with Conrad on. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad bringing Jesus to your face from ConradRocks.net. Check out the app. Check out the podcast page on ConradRocks.net. You can listen to all my podcasts. There's the links right there so you can find them everywhere. Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, uh, Shoutomatic, and Voicebo even. Yeah, you can find them all right there on the podcast page at ConradRocks.net. Making it easy for you to listen to me and also get the app. The Conrad Rocks app rocks for Jesus, and you love Jesus, right? Is your phone smart? Then it should be serving the Lord, amen? So checking out the Conrad Rocks app. It's in the sidebar of ConradRocks.net. Everything's at ConradRocks.net. Is your phone smart? Get the Conrad Rocks app. Listen anytime. Listen everywhere. So now... What if the Lord is doing a new thing right in front of your face while you have your Bible in your hand? <laughs> okay, so check it out. Isaiah forty three nineteen. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall be shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So God has a way of doing miracles. Hello, that's what God does. He does miracles. And that's usually a new thing, amen? Now, I want you to superimpose yourself back into these examples where something kind of new happened or something new and unusual. New in the Old Testament uh, usually meant something that which has never been seen before. It doesn't mean like a new car, like I have a new Ford F-150 truck. It means something completely new that's like mind blowing. Like, what is that dude? Right. And it's God. Um, oftentimes, you know, I, I heard there's examples in the Old Testament where it's, oh, he has a new weapon. So it's a weapon that you never, you never seen before and you don't know how to deal with it. You're like, well, how do I deal with this new weapon? I've never seen it before. I do not know how to react. Is it going to kill me? <laughs> you know, so you don't know. Isaiah forty three nineteen. Behold, I'll do a new thing that shall spring forth. God does things that are new sh- that that will spring forth. They'll just come out of nowhere, and then He'll make a way. How many times has He saved? You know the m- people of God. He does miracles. He makes a a wall of water on both sides of you while you pass through the Red Sea. Amen. So here's a couple of things, and I'm just thinking now we have to put ourselves back in the time that this happened and go. You know. If I had the biblical precepts up to that point, like in the book of Judges, God speaks to Gideon, the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, first off, a lot of people think, oh, well, you're hearing from the Spirit of God. Uh, that's not right. You know, there's denominations that base uh, that you can't hear from God. <laughs> you know, I'm serious. What would they think about Gideon? He's hearing from God. Well, maybe it was in that, in that dispensation, they might say. But put yourself back. In the, in the book of Judges, chapter 7, God is speaking to Gideon. He's saying, okay, I want you to pick your army. You got way too many people, dude. I know there's like 50 million people coming at you, but we really need to get your army down to 300. Because, like Paul said, God's strength is made perfect in his weakness, so he will rather boast in his infirmities. So the weaker Paul is, the more God gets to show off, and God gets the glory, and the name of Jesus is lifted up. So Gideon's army had to be small. He had to get it down to 300 so that God could show off. That's what he does. He's a God of miracles. You can't say, by my hand, I've done this. So God tells Gideon to pick his army by how they drink water. Do you drink it straight out of the water, or do you lap it with your hand? Is that how you would pick your army? What would you think if some general, let's say our 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 general in America, said, you know, we're kind of go against, uh, I'm not going to name anybody, but some super duper superpower, and just say, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna pick our battle 
by how our men drank their water. Would you want your kid to be in that army? (laughs) Okay. Think about it. What if you were presented with that information? What if someone came into church naked and started prophesying the word of the Lord? What if Isaiah, which ran around naked for three years as a prophet, okay, would you go, hey, there's a naked dude? Man, uh, you know what? He's got to be a prophet. (laughs) No, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to cook your noodle. Jesus cooked the noodles of those hugging tightly to Scripture. Remember how the Pharisees kept trying to go, you know, well, that's not biblical. You're breaking the Sabbath. You're, you know, they actually knew the Scriptures wrong, right? So we can't be haughty in our own estimation of how well we know Scripture, right? We got to be, we got to be careful. Can't have pride. You know, sometimes God will cook your noodles. As a matter of fact, that's how you know it's God. You know, in hindsight, we go, well, that's God. But during the moment, can you imagine being in the moment? Isaiah's running around three years naked prophesying, and you're like going, uh, there's no way that, there's no way. You know, how about the time Jesus was sitting in the, the house of the Pharisee and this girl, she was in sin and she was wiping his feet with her tears and clean it, drying it up with her hair. And the Pharisee's like, going, well, if this man was a prophet, he'd know. Well, guess what? See, that's that could be us. We could be sitting here judging the things of God, and we could be wrong. Look at Saul. I'm always talking about Saul. He knew the Bible. He knew it. He was at the feet of Gamaliel. He sat there under Caiaphas. He had letters from Caiaphas to go persecute Jesus, to go persecute Christians. You remember Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? Amen? So Saul was confronted with the new thing. He had a vision of the Lord, knocked him off of his high horse down to the dust from which he was created, and then he had to go, Lord, is that you? I mean, who are you? He didn't even know the Lord. So the point is, you can know the Scriptures all. You can know them really well. You can memorize Scripture. Even Satan used Scripture trying to kill Jesus in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. But you got to have a relationship with Jesus, which is the author and finisher of our faith. It's relationship. Amen? Hi, I'm Brenda. And I'm Eileen. Together, we are are Sisters Teacup Ministry for Women. Sharing God's message to hurting and broken women. You can find us on Facebook. I'm Eileen, and I'm having tea with Conrad. I'm Brenda, and I'm having coffee with Conrad. On on ConradRocks.net. Thank you for visiting ConradRocks.net. Conrad Rocks is supported by people just like you. If you've been blessed by Conrad Rocks, please prayerfully consider giving an offering. You can conveniently do so by using the Contribute button on the sidebar at conradrocks.net. Regular contributors get a spot on the Conrad's Comrades page, which links back to the blog or social media of your choice. You can also help Conrad Rocks by sharing your favorite posts on Facebook. Thanks again for being a part of Conrad Rocks. Remember, Jesus rules.
We talked about Gideon choosing an army by how they drink water. What if our Department of Defense did that today? We talked about Isaiah running around naked for three years, prophesying the word of the Lord. Would you listen to that man? (laughs) Okay. You might not do it if all you know is the text. You need to know God, right? How about somebody marrying a hooker that's unfaithful to them throughout their marriage? What if a man come into your congregation, he's married to a harlot that everybody knows in town, right? And then he starts prophesying. Are you going to listen to that man? Or are you going to sit there like the Pharisee judging Jesus when the woman was washing his feet with the tears of her face? And Jesus said, you know, man, she's more righteous than you, dude. That's basically what he was saying. She was seeking Jesus. He was condemning Jesus by his haughtiness of his stance on scripture. That's what it was. He goes, if a man, if this man were a prophet, he was judging him by, he was judging Jesus by his interpretation of the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament. It's the law and the prophets. Now, how about this? How about the time that King Saul, you know, he was in, he messed up and the kingdom was taken away from him spiritually, had not manifested yet on the earth. And he was seeking God through dreams, prophets, and something called Urim and Thummim. Urim and Thummim is something that we find in the Old Testament in Exodus and also in Deuteronomy. It's on the the garment of the priest, and it's the way it was over Aaron's heart, and he would pray, and it would light up. Uh, that's what I believe it did. I'm not dogmatic about it, but um, it would light up and give you a yes or no answer, or it would not light up at all, and it means you're not hearing from God, right? So one of the things we need to think of is when David when David is praying to the Lord, shall we go up after the Philistines? Notice he asked the Lord yes or no questions. Oftentimes, I think he might have been using the Urim and Thummim because it, cause God often answered him with yes or no answers. You ever notice that? Okay. Then... Um, so Samuel or Saul in First Samuel chapter twenty eight verse six, he finds that God's not even answering him from the Urim and Thummim. What if the head of our nation started in in the Oval Office <laughs> started going? You know, I got this breastplate from about four thousand years ago. I'm going to ask God and see if one of these rocks lights up, and that's how I'm going to uh, determine the fate of America. Right. What would you do? What would you think? <laughs> I mean, seriously, what what would you think? How about the tongues of fire in Pentecost, Acts chapter 2? We're always talking about, you know, Pentecost. Oh, we need Pentecost. Well, can you imagine being there in in, in knowing the Bible that was written up to that point and you're sitting here and you go, well, where's this in the Bible? Because I always hear people saying, where's that in the Bible? How do you find scriptural confirmation for that? Well, God does some things that, you know, he's going to do a new thing every once in a while. And my my current way that I work on that is, is that the spirit never violates the word. Like when Satan was trying to use the word to get Jesus to kill himself, you know, throw yourself off this building for it's written. His angels shall bear thee up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Well, Jesus found a contradiction. You know, do not tempt the Lord thy God. So there, if someone was claiming to be a prophet and was trying to get you to kill yourself, (laughs) not only does it violate common sense, it does have a contradiction in Scripture. And Jesus pointed that out. You know, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word shall agree. This is Jackie Smith from the Intentional Christian Paneur Podcast, and you are listening to Coffee with Conrad. Conrad rocks this show. Tongues of fire. What would you do if you were there? How would you react? You're hearing people speak in your language. All of them are speaking in your language, or you hear it in your language. Let's put it that way. The jury's out on exactly how that took place. But people are heard in their own tongue, and they're like, wait, what's up here? You know, they're trying to figure out what it is. It's Maybe they're drunk, and that certainly wasn't it, right? But there's tongues of fire, you know, and this tongues of fire thing was kind of recurred back in Azusa Street. You know, they called the fire department several times 
over the Azusa Street revival because there was fire over the building, you know, and it was spiritual fire. Or it could have been real, too. Jury's out on that one as well because people were calling the fire trucks. But they called the fire trucks. Okay, that's another good example. This is the way people reacted during the Azusa Street revival. They thought, well, my current wisdom, my current knowledge is to call the fire department. Think about that. Would you have called the fire department or run in there and get some of that Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire? Amen? What would we do? What would we do when something new like that happens? Now, sometimes I'll shake. And this is something that happened to me after I met God in 1995. It never happened before that. But when a presence of God comes into the room or I encounter someone that has the presence of God, I will sense it and I'll shake. And it's not something that I, you know, it just happens. (laughs) I don't know how to explain it. It just happens. Oftentimes when I would get into worship or I would start praying deeply, I, I found that I was groaning. People would point out that you're groaning. And I go, oh, gee, man, what's wrong with me? Is this scriptural? And then I found a few places in scripture how Jesus groaned within himself on the way to the tomb of Lazarus and all of creation groans and groaning with intercessions with words that cannot be uttered. You know, groaning is a scriptural thing. And I was doing it. I, I didn't know it was scriptural until after I had to look it up. It did not violate the word of God. So, you know, what do you do? You know, when, when your military leader picks the military by the way they drink water. What do you do when a guy that everybody says is a prophet starts to take off his clothes and walk around prophesying for three years? Do you listen to that man? What do you do when you're sitting in a congregation and this guy comes in with a, everybody knows she's the town prostitute and he's starting to prophesy. What are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do when the leader of your nation prays to a jacket and waits for a rock to light up to make his decisions that affect your life. What do you do when you're standing around a building and a bunch of people have fire on the top of their heads? What do you do? You know, what do you do when there's some guy standing next to you and he shakes or he starts groaning? You know, what do you do? So we need to be humble. Um, I'm sure we can at least agree to that. There's a phrase that I encountered about, I don't know, 10 years ago called contempt prior to investigation. So I'm open for new things because God says, behold, I will do a new thing. And he's a God of miracles. He works out the carnal mind cannot understand the things of God. It's at enmity with God. Spiritual things are spiritually discerning. God is a spirit. So, you know, I'm just going to say I'm working on the premise right now. When I see a new thing, (laughs) I'm going to check it against Scripture. But um, I'm still with the the precept that the Spirit and the Word agree. Amen. But I'm not haughty on my horse saying that, that I have Scripture completely down. As a matter of fact, I like having new epiphanies every once in a while, and a major one every few, like, six months. Because this, this is kind of a test with me. I like, you know, like the verse of the day that I do. I like to go for something new or dig deeper for an old revelation that I haven't meditated in that precept for a while. But when I do my Bible reading or when we do our devotionals or whatever, I like to get something new, something new. And if I get something new, it means something that I wasn't believing before. Amen. So seek something new. And that's that's a byproduct of digging deeper. Dig deeper. Get something new. How about that scripture where Jesus talks about the, the treasure, the guy with the treasure? He pulls out, out of the same treasure chest, he pulls out some things old, and he's showing it to you. you know, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. But then he shows you something new out of that treasure chest, which is the word of God. Amen. So look for something new. It's exciting. Following God is exciting. It challenges us. I'm going to challenge you to go deeper this week. Look for something new. Amen. Check out the support page at conradrocks.net. I got some sound issues. It'd be nice to have some more offerings bumped up for a little bit till we get um, 
get these problems solved in our in our new place. Also, um, check out the podcast page. You know, I have a new podcast page on conradrocks.net. You can find, you know, if you like Stitcher, iTunes, I'm all over the place, but this kind of puts a lot of the links in the same spot so you can find them real easy. And get the app. Get the app. God bless you. Till we meet again, dig deeper, go higher. Hi, this is John with Conor Shabba House. This is the kid renegade redeemed with Forever Redeemed Ministries. This is Amy from Amy Daily. This is Tiffany White with Hey Ministries. This is Dan the Coffee Man. Christine White, I'm a stander for the Lord. This is Glenda Linkus from WingsOfProphecy.com. Jill Dyson from Angel Street Ministry. This is Drift Teacup Ministry for Women. This is Marianne Sansom from Google Plus. This is Charles Michael from France. Holy Desperation Ministries.org. Jackie Smith from the Intent. Christian Panure Podcast. This is Janet with Overcoming Abuse God's Way. Spreading-joy.org. This is Gerald Thomas in New Hebron, Mississippi. This is Mordecai from Oklahoma. This is Vicki at Michael's House of New Beginnings. This is Stephen Barrett from Holy Fire, Japan. We are happy coffee with Conrad at ConradRocks.net. Conrad Rocks. Tune in radio.